Because of the spirit and the service and the worship and the songs that were um, selected, uh, I've decided to come back to worldliness and discuss that again tonight. We have so far to go in this study. Once a week is just, well, it's often enough to digest the material probably, but probably not enough to satisfy our ears and our mind, our heart, we're wanting to hear and learn more. We just introduced the subject last time with a rather long study I entitled The Christian and Worldliness, Parts 1 and 2. We're on scriptural responsibilities to yourself. And what we're on in this area would, of course, be mental responsibilities. There are certain verses, like Romans 12, 2, and another one I will give you tonight, and certain phrases that you want to keep forefront. And one of those would be mental responsibilities. Now, a lot of people don't even think that they have mental responsibilities. But we did sing a song tonight that we are not our own, that we belong to him, and so we are responsible to him, responsible to ourselves. But more basic than that, and first and foremost, and beyond our responsibilities to ourself just alone, and really there's no such thing as a responsibility to yourself alone, because if all you are is an animal, then you're not responsible. But since there is a God behind man, behind man's rational, spiritual, moral makeup, then man is responsible not so much to himself, but to himself and through himself to God. Things that we're going to say about the mental area, again, are not options. People are just wasting their minds today. Now, that is something that God has given us, and that's the basic component of man is his rational thinking power, his spiritual, moral, rational thinking ability that he has. And without that, you'd be an animal or worse. You'd be a tree or a rock. Now, if that's what is so important and so basic about us, and certainly God lays claim to that area in our life. And think how many people are wasting their minds today. Amen. People wasting it by not using it. A lot of people are doing that. Wasting their minds by putting the wrong thing into their mind. Just destroying and wasting something that God has given to us that is to serve as some sort of guide for us. And if we so pollute our mind that we dull or defile or sear our conscience, then we're going to be led off the right path in a hurry. And that is exactly and precisely what is happening in the lives of many people with the influence of Hollywood and the media and education and all of this. Their minds are being polluted with the tenets of humanistic secularism that is anything but scriptural and anything but God-pleasing and Christ-honoring, and with our minds being polluted by things like that, it's no wonder, it's no wonder that in all of these Christian, charismatic, and non-circles, people approach the Bible and can't seem to make any sense out of it. Right. It's because they're reading it already having been programmed to think right. contrary to God and contrary right. to Scripture. Right. So let that sink into your mind that we have responsibilities to ourselves, to God, to one another, we have responsibilities in the mental area. We have responsibilities, I said, for the maintenance and for the improvement of our mind, of our mental well-being. And you'll be the better for it. Sure, it's work. It's easy just to do nothing, but the people who do nothing are the ones who go to hell. Remember, you don't ever fall into righteousness or holiness. Um, you don't just stumble into that. You don't have to do anything, and you'll go to hell. It takes work. It takes discipline to make it into the kingdom of God. And I think Jesus addresses that subject more than once by saying, strive, strive, strive to enter in. If you don't strive, you'll just be like everyone else who does nothing. And we know where those people will go. Paul tells us in Romans 12, 2, not to be conformed to this world but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so the subject, of course, is, is worldliness because uh, it's a mental subject, although there are a lot of 
physical avenues and physical deeds involved in it. It certainly is a mental area, first and foremost. And once something affects a person's mind, then it's going to affect all of it. Now, we looked at a little history. We'll be doing a study of that more later, of um, where uh, fundamentalism came into American culture, some of the unconscious practices of Western civilization, as far as biblical moorings are concerned, over the last few centuries. We looked at a subject that is just being addressed all the time, and we need to be aware of it, and I made you aware of it again last time, that America, Western civilization, has lost its value system. Not only mindless materialism, but humanistic secularism have left in their wake a values vacuum, that people are void of having any value that is biblical, or I could say a value that they can articulate. Now, that's not to say that people are valueless. People have values. They have a worldview. They may not be familiar with the term worldview. They probably couldn't tell you what their worldview is because they don't know what a worldview is. They have a philosophy. They probably could not articulate that. Nevertheless, it's still the way they think, and you could determine what their philosophy is by watching the way they live. Everyone has that. When we say a values vacuum, we mean true values, not false values. True values you won't find in most people's lives. We started with such things as marriage and the family, that we've lost the biblical value system concerning marriage and um, the family life as well, uh, modesty, uh, truthfulness, community. I just read another article today that was a very interesting article. A lot of what I have, some of the information, will be um, input from material, of course, that I've come across and read. But we've lost the community sense in America. A, l a lot of this is due to a lot of the technological uh, inventions it just tends to make us more independent. And so it's just a spirit that has come across, especially people in the United States, that they're extremely independent. Um, you always hear of private property and private rights and personal rights. And you don't ever hear of anything like community welfare or community well-being or community thoughtfulness or, as Paul puts it in Philippians 2, preferring others above yourself. You certainly don't hear that. That's a community value there, of being concerned about others and not just ourselves. Now, there are reasons behind why people are thinking this. You drive down the road and you just see these signs tacked on trees everywhere. What does it say? Private property. Private property. Private property. Those of us who are hunters, that annoys us to no end. Because all you want to do is go on someone's hundred or thousand acres, kill a few squirrel, and get back off. You're not going to do anything. But I know the arguments behind it. Because we've become such an individualistic society, individuals will go on their land, will camp, will throw their beer cans and their junk everywhere, will slaughter their animals, will kill their cows, mistaking them for deer, will cut down their trees to build little huts while they stay there, and so forth. And so as a result of that, then we just see a development of that again in the sense of individualism they'll tack on their property i don't want you individuals in here because you act like individuals you're not concerned about the community and so i'll react against that by not being concerned about the community i'll be concerned about my individual self you see in tacking a sign up you're saying you're doing the same thing as those people who have come and desecrated your property there they weren't concerned about the community and now you aren't either all you're concerned about is yourself so see, I, there are good reasons why we have developed this way, but I think the, the, reason, the most basic reason that we have developed this way is we've lost our biblical values. We don't have clear teaching, and clear teaching in the scriptures and from the scriptures means that we're going to have to willfully decide to do certain things. They don't just fall on us like ripe cherries out of a tree. Yeah. But as you drive around and you see these signs, most people would never think of that. They don't think deeply about anything. And they certainly wouldn't think deeply about a rusted sign nailed on a tree somewhere. But I think about that. Now, what is that saying to me? What is that saying about my society where I'm going around this property and it's private property, private, private?
private, private, private. No trespassing, no trespassing, no trespassing. Everything is private. Well, we'll say more about that later when we discuss community values. In this study, while we're together this day, I want to look at two different areas, and they're both related. Some personal observations and some personal experiences. We are beginning a study so important that it, it will forever affect your life. Now, I'm not one just given to um, sermons punctuated with huge exaggeration so that the emotional pull and tug will keep you listening for the next hour because I know you're going to listen anyway. So if I make a statement like that, I must mean something by that. We're beginning a study that's so important it will affect the rest of your life. It will change the rest of your life. So listen to what's going to be said. Myself, I'm not asking for your obedience. I simply ask for your attention. God, through his spirit, is going to ask for your obedience. And more than ask, demand it of us as a requirement of Christianity and discipleship. And I want you to expect, as you probably already are, some of the most far-reaching things that you've learned so far in Christian ethics. Some of these you may uh, be privy to already in your suspicions. And maybe some of them you're not. But please don't just assume that you have the right answer. And that answer is I'm not supposed to be worldly. Because what does that mean? I'm not supposed to be worldly. We're back to this whole business of terms and definitions of worldliness. I said before, it's a negative, pessimistic, holier-than-thou term with overtones of religious smugness. That as long as you're on this side of it, you love the term, you use it against others, you use it to explain why you don't do certain things. And if you're on the other side of the term worldliness, you tend to hate it and resent it. That someone would call you worldly or what you're involved in, this is worldliness. So it's a battleground. Just the term itself is a battleground. And you get all of these divergent opinions about, now what is worldliness? Well, God made the world, they say. The people who would not fit in our camp. Well, God made the world. Didn't Solomon say that he made everything beautiful in its own time and way? Ecclesiastes 3. He made everything beautiful. So what does that mean? He made sin beautiful in some mystical or maybe perverted sense? They say we're to enjoy life. That's what Ecclesiastes is all about, that if God has given a man power to get wealth and to gain food and he gives him a long enough life to enjoy his wealth and eat his food, then this is contentment. Well, that's not all old Kohelet had to say in Ecclesiastes. And he was one who searched out life, and we're going to be talking about that a little tonight. And we'll probably be over there to the first chapter in one of the latter verses there here in a moment. That he gave himself to understand knowledge and to know wisdom in the world. He gave himself to that. And he came to certain conclusions after giving himself over to this. And he was one, however, and it is sad to say, who was not always in line with his own conclusions. We read that in the historical books of the Old Testament. That this man who gave himself to know the world and who later seems to have come to somewhat right convictions about his relationship to his world didn't practice those convictions that he had. And we know that God was very displeased with Solomon. Why? Because of all the wives that he married that were not Jews, they were not Israelites. And what did they then bring? What did he incorporate into Israel? Well, he built a special house for all of his wives. They were married for political, military, diplomatic reasons. It'd be like the League of Nations around Solomon's court with all of these women from everywhere. But what did they bring with them? Their worldviews, their philosophies. They were pagan, unchristian, unJewish worldviews. They influenced Solomon, and God was sorely displeased with him. And Solomon died, and the kingdom was divided at his, at his death in 931 B.C. as a result of that. We just have so many illustrations in the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, more on the Old because it's longer, of God's negative statements and his reaction against worldliness. But, of course, people have problems relating that to today because they wouldn't want to equate that with anything like going to the movie or 
going to senior prom at a Christian school, let's say, or, you know, dating or whatever. They would want to equate the two or relate the two because, of course, you're going to have to give up something that your carnal heart doesn't want to surrender. I want to start with three areas of observation tonight, and it concerns the arrangement of my study down at the bottom of the hill. And you'll see why we talk about such matters. Now, among other things, here are three things that I have down there. First of all, I have, and I've got different filing systems, but my basic filing system, so let's start with that. Number one, files. My basic filing system contains cuttings and clippings and filings of articles for teaching and reflection and study that I have come across from major, basically, secular magazines. And I have a very large, organized, multifaceted system. All of it somehow interrelated and cross-referenced. Of many different topics. Again, basically, this is not completely true, but basically clipped from major secular magazines. Now, of this rather extensive file system, which file do you think bulges the most? Now, we're talking about everything from nuclear war to abortion uh, to um, criminal justice, you know, to history of Watergate. I mean, anything like that, anything that I can use later, and a lot of it I have used, but I'd say 99% of it I've never used for teaching yet. There's most of it still there to use. Of all of that, of all these different subjects, which subject would you think bulges the most? Well, you probably couldn't really guess. But it's this subject. What's the last letter? <laughs> now, some might argue that's due to my interest in this subject. And since I'm interested in this subject, then naturally I'm attracted to articles about it. Well, that's hardly true. Others could argue that it has been demonstrated scientifically, and I've even come across one of these studies myself, and I don't vouch for its validity, but that when the three letters S, E, X are put together in that order on the printed page, it's the easiest word in the English language to spot. Now, I have practiced that experiment to see whether it's true, and it seems to be true in my case. Whether it is in yours, I don't know. But it could be argued the reason you've got so much about this subject in your files is the easiest word, S-E-X, when those letters are put together, there's just something dynamic, especially you see that X there. And if it was xylophone or xenophon, you probably wouldn't notice it. But when it's S-E-X, and you know it's a short word and it ends with X, it just seems to stand out as though it were written or underlined in red. Have any of the rest of you ever noticed that in your reading? Some of you are shaking your head. Maybe some of you not. All right, well, it doesn't make any difference, but it could be argued that way, I guess. That that's the reason why I have so many. But remember, we're not talking about finding this word somewhere on the printed page, like down in the fourth paragraph, the eighth sentence there. We're talking about articles. And the articles, you're going to have a big topic in big letters across the top, and Regardless of what it says, you read all of the topics, all of the, the bylines there of the article, even if you decide not to read the article. In other words, I'm saying I'd read all of them, so this one wouldn't stand out any more to me than any other. I think there are other reasons why my sex file bulges more than any other file. And the most basic of those is America's preoccupation with the physical body. And I think of topics worthy and necessary of study from a Christian perspective. Probably none are written on more profusely in the secular press than sexual matters. There are many other matters that are worthy of our study, many that we have or that we shall study. But perhaps none are written on more profusely that are worthy of our attention from a Christian point of view and perspective in the secular press than the subject of sex. 
So when we come to sexual matters and Christian ethics, we'll have much at our fingertips. And another area of observation. We would call that uh, files. In other words, I'm just showing you what's the largest thing. What am I coming across all the time? My files are just bulging. They, as a matter of fact, they bulge so much that they wouldn't fit in the folders anymore. And so then you have to divide it all up between different types of sexuality. And now, now perhaps, to be totally honest with you, it's not the thickest file. But that's only because I've taken it and divided it up. But if you put it all together like I had it a few months ago, it just bulged in there. The second area concerns this little um, card box that I keep on my desk. I think it's gray, a little gray card box. Three by five index cards fit in there. Now what this contains is my own indexing of all articles from various theological journals to which I subscribe. Some of my back issues go back oh, a quarter of a century. And I think I subscribe to maybe 10 or 12 of these and about 10 or 12 magazines as well. So theological journals are found here. They're all indexed, my own system, under a certain topic. Like, for instance, I was just indexing yesterday an article on uh, the identification of Babylon in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. So that'll be indexed under eschatology because that's what revelation is about and it'll be indexed under revelation as well so when you do a study of the book of revelation when you get to chapters 17 and 18 here's an article that deals with the topic of those two chapters the identity of babylon whether it's one or two whether it's a commercial and religious or commercial religious commercial hyphen religious babylon that we're talking about there but anyway so sex is the most prominent here in files what would be the most prominent in my card box of articles from theological journals. Oh, that's very large. That's probably number two. And if you, if you get too many of Dallas's journals, and sometimes they, they have nothing but eschatology, so it'll um, actually overcome my other one. That's probably second. What's first? Have you ever heard me talk about this subject before? Hermeneutics. Oh. Oh, they just are writing on that all the time. How are we in America, the late 1980s, to relate to and to interpret the ancient scriptures? Given to a pre-scientific, pre-industrial, pre-technological, Near Eastern, non-Oriental, or non-Occidental, rather, society. How are we to relate to that? I mean, given to nomads wandering in the Sinai Desert, how are we in the age of nuclear power and computers, how are we to relate to something like that? Well, those of us who believe in the inspiration of Scripture, we would say that's one of the greatest marvels. That's probably the greatest marvel of the Bible, is that it's always contemporary. It always speaks to man. No one could ever have written a book that long ago that speaks to man as that book does. A book that was given to nomads wandering that drank camel's milk and, I mean, did weird things. And how can we relate to that today, driving automobiles and sending people to the moon and talking about going to Mars now in the first part of the next millennium? Biblical hermeneutics. The science or the discipline of interpretation. How do you interpret the scriptures? And then I have a third area which takes up most of my library that we call books. Now, I'm always buying new ones. So what do my buying habits inform me about current Christian publishing? See, I try to be aware of these things. That way, since I do a lot of filing and indexing, I'm not just reading just for the sake of reading, but I'm looking for what's going on. What are the trends that we see taking place now? America, we see that secular press is always talking about something sexual, and I'll show you that, and I'll prove that to you in some of the most interesting ways whenever we talk about sexual matters lately, later. But we're so preoccupied with the human body, with the right look and the right clothes, the right this, that, or the other. And hermeneutics for that, books, I'm always buying them, so I'm trying to observe what's coming out 
as far as Christian publishing is concerned. Well, the reason we're looking at these observations is so I can get to this third one and give you the clue here, which ties us back into our message. Books are coming out all the time now, especially this um, Multnomah's series. I think they're up in Oregon. Multnomah's Critical Concern series on the Christian's relation to his world. Well, you can see how the subject of worldliness would come in right away. The Christian's relation to his world, his social obligation or whatever we want to call it. I prefer to call it this, the Christian's relation to his world. How is he to relate to his world? I mean, there's so much going on in the world. We've heard so many different opinions about what is wrong to do as a Christian, what is right to do, and what the Baptists do, and what the Pentecostals do, and what am I allowed to do? And so people are confused on that. You know, we hear this business of the people starving in Africa. You know, are we to help them? Are we to support them? What are we to do about that? Uh, we hear people, it surface er, surfaces every now and then that people are opposed to theater and that people are opposed to television. Well, what should our response be? What should our attitude be about the theater and television and the media, the media as a whole and education and, you know, whatever comes into view here, how are we to relate to our world? What about these inner city slums? What should we do about that? What about all the legislation that's being passed now that much of it seeming to have an anti-Christian slant? What should we do concerning that? Revolt, try to have the laws change, just obey what the laws say, leave society, found a commune. What are we to do? And I'll give you more proof than just multnomas here whenever we come to that later because I have a lot of proof of that we're seeing a lot of that coming out from Christian publishing companies today, which then would alert me to the fact that this subject of worldliness is swirling around in Christian circles and that people's minds are simply not made up. They have unmade minds, like leaving the bed unmade. Their minds are unmade. They don't know what to do, so they just leave everything undone. And people are rushing to write and publish books, and I guess that means people are rushing to read these books You've got to have an audience before you publish out there to find out what should I do. Now, these are three interesting points then. Sex, biblical interpretation, the Christian's relation to his world. Those are three very interesting points. The three things that I have to rate highly because of the way I'm finding these things in my own files. Maybe if you understand that, you'll understand why over the years my sermons and lectures have been laced with various illustrations or jokes or comments or whatever that could be tacked down to one of these three areas here. It's not that I'm some sexual deviant or hermeneutical fool or that I'm a worldly-minded Christian. But if those are the issues, and they certainly are, and this business of um, hermeneutics is, is probably, it's the newest, I would say, of those. At one time, we pretty much thought we knew what the Bible meant. There was the conservative and the liberal view, those two, and that was all. But now you have four liberal views and 19 conservative views about the matter. And you could pick any of those 19 and still be called a conservative, still stay in the conservative camp. This wasn't true not that many years ago. But, of course, as you know from Old Testament introduction, we trace all of these problems back to Germany and we trace these problems back to the 19th century. I mean, there, those people, those scholars gave us all of these false views, the higher critics that wanted to begin to think critically about the scriptures and if, if that's all we do, that's okay as long as we end up with right conclusions. But they made man suspicious. They made Christians, the church, unsatisfied with just the standard traditional church view which had been passed down about, let's say, the date of Adam, the age of the earth, unsatisfied with that. And we have an explosion of works. That gave us liberalism, and then liberalism has spawned its own children, and as a result of that, Western civilization has lost its moorings. Now, these people, like um, 
Wellhausen and Kunin and the rest of these men from Germany a century and a half ago, I'm sure never realized what their pens were going to do to Western civilization. I mean, they'd say every person's entitled to what? Their private, their own opinion. And so here's what we believe is right. But we had a whole undermining of the biblical faith, of the message of Scripture. I mean, when you start saying Moses did not write the Pentateuch, all right, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if Moses wrote it or Joshua wrote it unless there are certain scriptures that say that Moses wrote it. Then, if there are, then we can't trust scripture. I mean, I'm reading a, a commentary series right now. We're in the business of Elijah and Elisha's miracles. And, of course, those miracles didn't really happen. But this commentary said, explains them by saying, but it doesn't matter whether they happened or not because there's a certain spiritual lesson behind the miracle. And that's what was intended for us today. And, and the miracles, you know, the lesson was simply given via the cultural way in which such things were taught with saga and magic. Well, the problem with that is if the illustration itself is non-historical and it pretends to be historical, I mean, it's, it doesn't say it's a proverb. It says this is what happened. In other words, if it's non-historical, it's not reliable. If, it's not reli if the historical event itself is not reliable, neither is its spiritual meaning. Because its spiritual meaning has no foundation. And those critics don't seem to be able to comprehend that. They think it doesn't matter. You know, you can believe it doesn't matter about the manna and the crossing of the Red Sea. That's not what God is after. What he's after is the lesson to the people. But you see, that lesson becomes void if it has no foundation. Amen. If God said, I'm trying to teach you something by the crossing of the Red Sea, and they never really literally crossed it, then how can you get a lesson out of something that didn't happen? For the continuation of the... If God said, I'm trying to teach you something by the crossing of the Red Sea, and they never really literally crossed it, then how can you get a lesson out of something that didn't happen? But the critics have not thought that deeply about that. And so they have come and robbed us of all of those things. And now you'll see why those studies that we did in OTI were very important. If you're robbed of that, then the scriptures are no longer the standard, as they are written, the standard for our life. So if we don't believe that they crossed the Red Sea, maybe we don't believe the spiritual matters in about holiness and separation from the world. If the Bible loses its authority in historical areas, then it loses its authority, period. Sure, it's a spiritual book, and sure, spiritual lessons are told through historical occurrences, but those historical occurrences are actually, we'll go a little deeper here, are actually history and not history. They are actually history. Bart, Bart was the one who came along and made the big distinction between these two words. They are actually history. And you know what we mean by history. They are not history. It's a German word. They are not history, as Bart meant them. That is, something that was non-historical, but you could still gain a spiritual lesson from it. Now, that's not to say that all of the proverbs and allegories were literal historical fact. They weren't. But they were told as being non-historical. I mean, whenever Nathan came and gave this little illustration about a man with one little lamb and the other man had many lambs, and the, I mean, it was meant to be a story. So we don't have to believe that that literally happened and we could still gain a spiritual meaning from it. But if he came and said this literally happened and he told a lie and then tried to draw a story from it, the story has no basis in. So that is why hermeneutics has become so important today. How do we interpret scripture? Can we go back there? Of course, the obvious answer is yes. The scripture is contemporary and it's reliable. And we can know what it has to say, but we're going to have to be honest. And we can know as nuclear age American Christians. We can know what these scriptures meant and what they mean, even though they were given so many millennia ago to nomads wandering in the wilderness. So if you wonder why, and, and I'm dropping hints about, well, this passage should say this or should be written in this manner or notice how this connects to that. 
It's to keep you thinking, to get you thinking, and to keep you thinking about hermeneutical questions. I don't always, most of the time I don't, come along and answer those right then. But you're made aware of the fact that there is a question here, uh, sometimes one that's not so worthy of even questioning, but still someone has questioned it, and so we need to be made aware of that. Now you know why I've maybe used many illustrations that perhaps most pastors wouldn't use in sexual areas. They just wouldn't talk about that. It's because there are so many uh, pure, um, impure inroads being made into the minds of American people via the news media that we have to be aware of what those are and be able to guard against them. I haven't even determined myself exactly how we're going to deal with those matters in the future. What I mean by that is in mixed company with small children in very detailed sexual areas, I don't know. But I'm sure the Lord will show us by the time we get there. But I don't know whether we want children or it's children really aren't the problem. It'd be teenagers that'd be the problem because they're of that age. Do they need to be hearing various matters whenever they're not married? Well, maybe not. If not, you'll have to babysit yourself somewhere else while we talk about it. And then the week before you get married, your parents will loan all of their tapes to you on that subject. <laughs> In other words, the information will be available whenever you need to know it. Some things would, be, would do more damage to know at the wrong time. There's a time to know things, and there'd be a time that there'd be no sense in knowing. It wouldn't do you any good. It could produce harm, and it couldn't produce good. So we'd want to steer clear of that. There are some of my personal observations. Now, secondly, this evening, some personal experiences. Those of us on this narrow side of the question of worldliness tend to think of ourselves as authorities on the subject and its evils. But I would simply ask you to be humble and admit that you're not. Be humble and admit that it is a very complex area. Although it may be easy to sum it up and say worldliness is wrong, I don't know that we all know what we mean by what we say when we make that statement, that worldliness is wrong. What I want you to see, more than anything, what I want you to see are the value systems and the worldviews and the philosophies behind these various questions and events and even movements in American history and society. More than anything else, that's what I want you to see. That's where so much of my ministry is directed to get you to think about certain things and not just, well, as a little Catholic or Jew at heart, take your 10 or 11 or 50 commandments and memorize them and then like a robot try to perform them. Now, I said last time that I wanted to give you a, it's very brief, but a brief autobiographical account of my own experience in and thinking on worldliness since coming to know Jesus 13 years ago. Now, I don't know exactly what your experience has been, but I want to share with you what mine has been and some lessons that I've learned from this. When I was first saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, there was an inner witness I think before I ever really heard much about the, the whole subject of Christian discipleship, there was an inner witness that I should disassociate myself from the world and its influence. Now, I think anyone truly converted has the same type of witness. People are not always at the same level of performing, that is, obeying the witness that they have. But isn't it interesting, why is it when people first get converted, they think that they shouldn't listen to any more rock and roll music or something? Maybe their conscience in certain areas is, is so defiled that they don't, they don't really think about certain areas, but there's a sense in which you turn away from worldly friends, and the only reason for not turning away is you're staying around long enough to win them, but I mean, you've lost contact with those worldly friends. No one has to tell you anything. It just seems to happen. And then somehow the, the business of rock and roll music or worldly friends or whatever you used to do, that that then is imputed to the whole world around you and its influence. And then you deduce and you say to yourself in your mind, God has saved me for another place and for his kingdom. So I somehow am to disassociate myself from this world and from its influence. So that was the inner witness that I had. And I think under a lot of the early Christian teaching that I received, 
um, I was fairly successful at disassociating myself. When I say fairly, I mean above 50%, but I don't mean I even approached 80%, somewhere in between. Uh, because I only had certain Christian teaching that was good. Some that I had was not good, and that which I had that was good oftentimes didn't go far enough, as you'll see from these studies later on. I remember going to the library with a friend of mine. It would have been in, oh, perhaps the 11th grade, 10th, 11th, or 12th, I think the 11th grade, in high school. Uh, I remember exactly where we were on the road. It was at night in a friend's green Mustang. We were going to the library to study, and I guess whenever, whenever you're newly converted, and I was fairly newly converted at the time, when you're in high school, and you don't have the you don't have the type of church environment that you should have that's intended by Jesus in the New Testament that we have here. You don't have that positive influence in your life. I had kind of a mixed bag of various things. Then you're not as straight as you should be. But I remember this day, the Lord had really been speaking to my heart, and I remember telling this brother who was a Christian, not baptized in the Holy Spirit, with whom I was driving, but telling him that God had been laying on my heart, James 4, 4 that to be a friend of this world is to be an enemy with God. And you know, people who are on the other side, Christians who are on the other side of this term, thought of worldliness, they, that will bristle their hair, even to mention a verse like that around them. Because they kind of know what you mean by that, and, and what they, they, they name tag, they put a tag on you, a name tag on you as a naive person. That you're, they're superstitiously naive about the world, you are insecure in your Christian convictions. You are uh, so weak and vacillating that you fear that if you come close to the world, you might compromise or something. And now they are the strong ones, and they're strong in their Christianity, and they can live in the world and not be tainted by the world. And they don't like people who think of thoughts like that or mention verses like that. James 4.4, 4, to be a friend with the world is to be an enemy with God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. The carnal mind, we're told. It's the worldly mind. The carnal mind is enmity with God. That's Romans chapter 8. The spiritual mind, Paul said, is what? Life and peace. Spiritual mind, he said, it, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death because you're in enmity with God. They don't like thoughts like that. It's too convicting to them. It seems like everyone, even though they might not come down on our side of the issue, they know what the term worldliness means. They might call their experience by a different name, but they know what it means. Worldliness means those can'ts and don'ts that I enjoy doing, but that you say that I shouldn't, that I should neither enjoy nor participate in. But to get back to my experience, I was fairly successful. I knew that the world was wrong. It was evil. I had... Uh, a few years after I was saved, but even better teaching than I had earlier, teaching against the world and its ways. And I think you could perhaps glean from the hundreds of messages you've heard and the tapes that are out, um, various episodes in my life where I was made a laughing stock of or whatever because of my convictions. But as I studied more and more, then I came to see that much of these people's reasoning was on the basis of imprecise, superstitious fear of the world and not what I would think and what I would want for myself, a clearly articulated philosophy of biblical denial and separation. Now, whenever that happened, then I kind of shifted <laughs> my attitude. I shifted in my position as a Christian to one that has um, this term, this phrase has appeared, I think, many times, especially in recent years, and I was one that wanted to think about it and investigate it. A lot of people are writing under this thought pattern today, sanctified worldliness. Now again, follow what I'm saying.
You know, I'm anti the world. That's what I was taught as a Christian. That's what the inner witness in my spirit was, to be anti the world, to be a denier of the world, a world denier, not a world affirmer, to be one to separate, not only deny, but to separate from the world and from its evil influence. Then I got thinking about it, and it was not so much that I disagreed, because I really didn't, not in my heart of hearts, disagree with the doctrine of world denying and world separating, but I had a problem with their basis. I thought it was very imprecise, and I thought it was based on a superstitious fear of the world from the perspective of almost someone raised in a cornfield who thinks of the big bad world out there as some evil uh, four-armed 19-tooth monster that was after them and so they said don't do that and don't go there and watch out and, and it was just watch out don't 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 have this don't wear that don't do this but it wasn't any why 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 it wasn't any why 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 there was no teaching on well all right if I'm not supposed to why what is the philosophy behind my denying this world you can't just say that the world is evil I mean that is right that the world is under Satan's influence but I've got to have more than that to sink my teeth into and so my second position was in my own mind in my own heart my own thought pattern let's say uh, I shifted toward this position of Christian sanctified worldliness I think more as an investigative experiment than a full-fledged commitment. Obviously, it was not a full-fledged commitment because I'm not there today. Now, I know, so we're going to get to a step three, which is the happy ending to the story. I know a large number of people. I think all Christians start off right here. There is a witness that says no to the world. And I think most of them end up right down here, step two, Christian sanctified worldliness. They believe they can be a Christian and still participate in some of the evils of the world, and somehow it's not going to affect me. They don't think about it. They, don't, they cannot clearly articulate their position, but that's their position nonetheless. Now, I sort of wandered around in this stage, too, for a few months before I was really able to come to grips with what I was experiencing, before I was able to pick up some signals from God and from myself, signals that were saying, I am uncomfortable here. I am uncomfortable here. That was enough for me to begin to pick up those signals and realize what I was being told. I am uncomfortable being where I am I believe this is wrong. Now, you want to listen to the witness that you have in yourself as you attempt to live your Christian life in this world. And you have to listen. Is yourself saying to you, I am uncomfortable here? See, I did not feel comfortable there. It could be argued, maybe I didn't feel comfortable back here in step one. Well, I didn't really feel that comfortable whenever I started seeing the very shallow reasoning behind people's rejection of the world. I thought, oh, wait a minute. You know, if your reasoning is wrong, maybe your rejection of the world is wrong too then. I didn't really, I didn't really embrace that or I wouldn't be down to step three where I am today. But I thought, your reasoning is not right. You don't know what you're talking about. You, you don't even know. You don't know what the world is about. You don't even know. You have just grown up with this superstitious fear of the world. And I'm going to give you illustrations of all this later if you're not following what I'm saying. <clears throat> but a lot of fundamentalists and Pentecostals have grown up that way. It's kind of a superstitious fear of the unknown. They don't know what's out there. But if it's, if it's unknown and it's unexperienced, then it's fearful as far as they're concerned. Grandma said don't do that. And you read cases of men now who as little boys grew up in the pulpit of fire and brimstone messages. And of if you do this, if you go in that movie theater and all you could, you've never been in one before, but all you can picture is if you went in there and, and you came out of there, you went to see a worldly movie, then, you know, God, he'd probably be meeting you at the door with swords and thunder and a booming voice. You didn't know what was behind those doors, but it was mysterious. And because it was mysterious, it was a temptation to you. 
All right, you see what I'm saying? No one had unmasked what was going on behind those doors. They simply said, don't go to movies. They're bad. That's wrong. That's worldly. That's carnal. And you see, it's unknown. And if it's unknown, it's tempting then. I mean, it seems like the very one thing you tell your child now, don't do this. All of a sudden, you create a desire in them to do that. If you're a wise parent, you, you try to think of ways to steer them away from that without ever saying anything about it. And we're all like that as old carnal people. As soon as someone tells us you can't have it, we want that. We didn't want it before until they said you can't have it. What happened with Adam and Eve? This tree, no. Well, all of a sudden, that's the one that I want. Had all those trees in the garden. But it was the one God said, don't eat. Now see, he's testing man there. Man would have survived if God just would never have told him about that tree over there. <laughs> just don't ever tell him about it. He would have survived then. But then he would never have proved his, or in this case he didn't prove it, but proved his trustworthiness. So, you know, a person can be innocent but not trustworthy. You don't know whether you would ever steal something because you've never been a teller in a bank. You're innocent. You've never stolen, but are you trustworthy in that area? We'll put you around money where you could take some and no one would find out. Then you become not only innocent, but now your character is proved and you become pure in your life then. It's one thing to have an unproved character of innocence and another thing to have a proved one of trustworthiness. And that's really the basic story behind the temptation with Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam was, was innocent but he had an unproved character, and God proved his character. So anyway, getting back to what I was saying, you'll find that with your children. You tell them, I, I, this is something I don't want you to see. It's best just to hide it without telling them you don't want them to see that, because it creates, because it's the unknown, it creates a temptation. And so we're back to this business of imprecise reasoning behind things, not an adequate basis, simply don't, don't, don't. And if you just give us a don'ts, then you fail to unmask the whole situation behind that. In other words, what I'm arguing is a person does not have to attend the theaters to find out that they're wrong. But just because a person is refraining from going doesn't necessarily mean he's right with God. Because he may be doing it on a wrong basis. It's simply fear. He's acting out of fear. He's not acting out of faith. The only way you can act out of faith is to have some knowledge to base your faith upon. We can't just say, I've got faith. You have faith in things. And you have to have some knowledge, something that is concrete, something that exists in order to have faith about it. So you fear something because you fear the unknown. What do you have faith in? Well, you're not really obeying God because you're not going, because you're not having faith in anything. You say, well, what are we going to do different than that? Well, we'll understand a lot about the media and movies and television production and understand their philosophy. Those aren't people who just put on any movie they want to put on. They have a philosophy that they're working by. We'll understand that. Then we'll have something to reject and to resist. Otherwise, all we are resisting is a darkened room from which floats the nice odor of buttered popcorn <laughs> which is very enticing <laughs> it's just a darkened room in which you smell popcorn well what are you what are you resisting then there's nothing to resist there until you know what goes on behind closed doors so i was finally able to pick up from my spirit signals i am uncomfortable here and i got back on an earlier path but it was kind of an, er an earlier path now revised because it was one that was more thought out. 